Hello everyone, this is Teach My Channel and I'm Sarah. In today's video, we will talk about opioids and it's going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, we will discuss the mechanism of action, clinical uses, and side effects. But first, we need to distinguish between the word opiate, which means any agent derived from the plant opium, and opioid, all other substance, either exogenous or endogenous, that gives you morphine-like properties. And now, let's get started with the pharmacodynamics of opioid. Opioid receptors are distributed throughout your body. There are three types of receptors, mu, kappa, and delta receptors. When opioid binds to the receptor, it exerts different effects depending on the affinity. It can be agonist, which means activating the receptor, partial agonist, or antagonist, where it does not activate the receptor. Examples of endogenous opioid would be beta endorphin binding to the mu receptor, dynorphin binding to kappa receptor, and enkephalin binding to the delta receptor. And now let's talk about how it works. But first, let's talk about the pain stimulus. When there is a pain stimulus traveling through the neuron, it reaches the presynaptic area, and let's zoom in. The action potential will propagate, causing a positive charge. This positive charge will allow the calcium channel to open, and calcium will enter, binding to the vesicle. The vesicle will fuse, and then neurotransmitters will be released. So what does the opioid do? Opioid will bind to the G-protein coupled receptor called the GI, which means inhibitory. So if it binds to the G receptor, the opioid will inhibit this action by reducing the formation of cyclic AMP and then one of the two. If it binds to the kappa receptor, it will block the calcium channel, so no more calcium entering and no transmitter release. If it's the mu or delta receptor, then it will open the potassium channel, allowing the potassium to leave, making hyperpolarized presynaptic area. Both actions will halt or stop the signal from being transmitted to the next neurons, so no more pain. In summary, opioid agonist binds to the GI receptor, causing reduction in cyclic AMP, either opening potassium channel or closing calcium channel, giving you an end result of decreased neurotransmitters release. Next is pattern of effect and classification. We said opioid can be full agonist, partial agonist, and antagonist. Of the full agonist, fentanyl is the most potent with rapid onset and short duration makes it a good option to be used as an anesthetic. However, codeine is the weakest. We add it with acetaminophen in a combination called Tylenol number 3 or number 4 for mild pain. All opioid can cross the placenta and reduce the muscle contraction of uterus. However, out of these opioid, the least is meperidine, makes it a good option to be used during labor. Lastly, methadone. It has a long half-life. That is why it's a good option to be used during withdrawal symptoms after someone with opioid dependence. The first three of partial agonists, pentazosine, papronorphin, and potrophenol, are mixed antagonist and agonist used for moderate pain. And tramadol is used for severe pain. Lastly, let's talk about the pharmacokinetic of opioid. Opioid can be administered by different routes. However, if the patient is taking it orally, then this is can be associated with the first pass effect, meaning that it gets metabolized in the liver, giving you less effect of opioid. Morphine can be converted to morphine 3-glucuronide, which means if this substance accumulates in the body and you cannot excrete it, like in someone with renal failure, it will cross the blood-brain barrier and causes seizure. Also, morphine can be converted to morphine 6-glucuronide, an active form of morphine just adding more effect to morphine. Opioid duration of action is somewhere between 4 and 72 hours. It is metabolized by the liver and excreted by the kidneys. In the beginning, we said that opioid receptors are distributed throughout the body, and now we're going to talk about their effects. In the CNS, it can cause analgesia, which means pain relief. It causes euphoria, that is, a pleasant feeling of happiness, except with methadone. It causes sedation, so yes, you can use it as a sedative. Respiratory depression, so keep in mind, never administer opioid with other medication or substance that has the same side effect, like phenobarbital and alcohol. It causes cough suppression, 
meiosis, and this is clinically important. If someone presented to you with respiratory depression and unconsciousness, check their eye for meiosis, constriction of pupils, and if it's there, give them opioid antagonists like naloxin. Lastly, nausea and vomiting through the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Next is the peripheral tissue's effect of opioid. In the heart, it causes bradycardia except for meperidine. It also causes arterial and venous vasodilation. So, as a side effect, it can cause cardiac depression. In the GI tract, it decreases the mortality and the patient can present as a side effect with constipation. And for a clinical use, you can use opioid for someone with diarrhea, right? It also increases the contraction of biliary smooth muscle and sphincter of OD. So never give opioid to someone with biliary stone. Lastly, opioid causes the release of histamine, causing pruritus, like flushing, warm skin, sweating, urticaria, and itching. And here's a summary from TeachMed for what we have explained in the first part of opioid.